Well, now we're looking at the production budget and a few things to point out here. The first line of the production budget is budgeted sales. We had already done that in the sales budget. Remember we did the sales budget per units and per dollars. Well, once we figure out how many units we're going to sell each quarter, we got to meet that demand, right? So we have our, we start with our budgeted sales. We also have our second line, which is our desired ending inventory. What we want to end the quarter with as far as inventory. And we have an assumption here, if you look down at the bottom, 10% of the next quarter's sales. So for security reasons, for safety reasons, just in case there's a disruption in production in the next quarter, it's felt that a buffer inventory of 10% of the next quarter's sales makes sense. So 10% of 60,000 is 6,000, so we add, we have to make that in this quarter as well. In the third quarter, we're gonna sell 80,000. 10% of that is 8,000. We need to end quarter two with that volume. And again, quarter four, we have 40,000. 10% of that is 4,000. So look at this. Where do we get the 3,000 from? Well, that is an estimate of quarter one of the following year. So for quarter one of the following year, we're estimating 30,000 units. Why? Because if we're going to end with 10% of the next quarter sales, this is 3,000. That must be 30,000. So in other words, to get the production budget for the year done, not only do we need estimates of each quarter sales, but we also need the following quarter of the next year estimated sales to get our ending inventory. Now, once we have that, there provides our total needs. We simply just add the two columns together, we get our total needs. But we don't start from zero every month. We have some beginning inventory. This beginning inventory is what we ended last year with. Where do we get this number? We get that number from the balance sheet. Finished goods inventory will tell us how many units we have. If in the first quarter we need 26,000 units, and we already have two, we need to make required production 24,000. And again, we follow through each column like this. Notice that our ending inventory in the first quarter becomes our beginning inventory of the next quarter. Ending inventory of uh, uh, a desired ending inventory in quarter two is our beginning inventory of quarter three, etc. So this comes from the balance sheet. Each of the next beginning inventory numbers come from the previous quarter. So we need to go outside of the production budget twice. Once we have to go backwards to our ending balance of finished goods inventory to bring forward the beginning inventory. And then once we have to go forward one quarter on the sales budget to get our desired ending inventory. Now, when we do the balance sheet for the end of the year, we now have our ending inventory for December 31st, 2015. So now we filled in another number. Final thing to note, watch this last column. Be very careful with it. This 200,000 is the sum of each of these numbers in each quarter, as each is the sum of budgeted sales for all four quarters. But this 3,000, the desired ending inventory, is the ending inventory in quarter four only. We end the year with what we end quarter four with. Don't fall into the trap of summing across all four quarters to get a total here. The next number is the 200,000 plus the 3,000 to get total needs, 203. Do not add across here. If you do, you'll be 4,000 plus 8,000 plus 6,000 units higher. The beginning inventory for the year is the beginning inventory at the beginning of the year. So careful not to use the ending beginning inventory. And finally, our, our total is 203 plus 2,000 to get, uh, uh, sorry, minus, because it's at the beginning inventory, 2,203 minus 2,000 for 201. You can also sum across here. So the first number and the last number, you can sum across all four quarters, but in between, you cannot do that. Ignore these numbers when you're doing this column. That's the production budget. From the production budget, we're now in a position to do all of our three major product costs, material, labor, and overhead. So let's have a look at the direct materials purchases budget. It starts with our required production. 
So the last line of the production budget gave us these numbers, 24,000 in quarter one, 62,000 in quarter two, 76 in quarter three, and 39 in quarter four for a total of 201,000 units that must be made. Each unit requires so much in raw materials. So in this, in this example we're using for Patterson framing, there's only one raw material component. We're making frames, so we need wood. And it basically tells us one meter of wood per unit, per frame, is what's needed. But we might be making a product that has six separate components, and we might need three of these, five of these, seven of these. So you would have a raw materials purchases budget for each of the components. This is for the, the, the first component. You'd have your production need in meters. Sometimes you'd have your next line uh, would be the second unit that you need and the third item that you need. Or you might have separate direct material purchases budgets or what are called sub-budgets. Let's say there were six units that were needed to make one complete unit. You'd have six of these culminating in one master budget for, for raw materials. But in this one, it's a very simplified example. We're, we're making it very easy. We need one input and we only need one unit of that input for each unit of output. So you multiply the two together to get our production needs in meters. We need 24,000 meters in the first quarter, 62,000 meters in the second quarter, etc. And we have a desired ending inventory as well. And we can see that it is 10% of next quarter's needs. So just in case there's some supply disruption or there's a delay in shipping, we don't want to be caught off guard. We want production to proceed smoothly. We feel it's safe to end the month with at least 10% or sorry, end the quarter with at least 10% of next quarter's needs. So that sets out our total needs in meters for every quarter. Well, we don't start from zero again. We have, we subtract our beginning inventory. Our beginning inventory in the first quarter comes from the balance sheet. Our ending inventory uh, for the fourth quarter comes from our projection of quarter one for the next year. And we have our raw materials to be purchased after that. How many units of raw materials that we need. Now we have one more line. We have a new line that we didn't have in the production schedule. The cost of the raw materials to be purchased. So whatever the cost is, we multiply it and we get a total cost. Not only do we get the total in units, but we have the total in cost. The second part of these budgets of the, well, for the raw materials at least, we'll see that it's not always the same for each of the three major product categories. But for raw materials, we have a schedule of expected cash disbursements. Why? Because we're going to be buying them on credit. Typically, we buy from suppliers. We get 30 days uh, uh, to pay. Well, we may not pay for something in the quarter that we received in the quarter, but we may pay for it in the next quarter. So we need some assumption of how we pay for this, and we have it right here. 70% of all purchases are paid for in the quarter. 30% of it is paid for in the following quarter. So it takes two quarters to clear out one quarter's purchases. We pay 70% now, 30% later. So. When we get to quarter one, the first thing we have to deal with is, well, we owe from quarter four of last year. So there's our accounts payable brought forward to clear that out. And there's our first quarter purchases and paid for in the second quarter for a total of 111,200. There's that total paid for. Then we have second quarter purchases. 70% of 253,600 will be paid for this month, 30% next month, added across this number. Uh, should equal quarter two. Then we have third quarter port purchases again, just 70% and 30%. 70% of what? 70% of quarter three's total purchases will be paid for. 30% next month. This uh, total for third quarter purchases should equal the total for third quarter purchases. And then fourth quarter, only 70%. We don't account for the other 30% because it doesn't show up in our cash disbursement schedule. The other 30% becomes the ending accounts payable total for 2015. So we filled in another item on our balance sheet. So if we're filling in our balance sheet uh, uh, as we go through these budgets, by the time we end with the cash budget, you'll see that we've completely filled in uh, the, the budgeted balance sheet. So we have our total cash disbursements 
and our total cash disbursements are not necessarily equal to our total purchases because of these delays in accounts payable. If we run a business whereby we pay for everything as we get it, then we wouldn't need an expected cash disbursement schedule. If we pay for everything as it arrives in the door, everything is paid for in the quarter uh, um, in which it's, it's purchased. Let's look at the direct labor budget. This one's a little bit simpler. <clears throat> Here are units to be produced. And notice that we have our, our uh, uh, direct labor time per unit right below it. So if we need to produce 24,000 units and it takes 0.5 hours to produce each one, we have a total for direct labor hours in every quarter that's needed. <clears throat> we'll multiply that by our cost per hour and we get our total direct labor cost. Now, two things need to be pointed out here. Number one, we have no schedule of cash disbursements. That's because there are no accounts payable when it comes to wages. Every Friday or every second Friday, you got to pay for it. <clears throat> so we're making the assumption that all the wages incurred within a quarter are paid within that quarter. We're going to just overlook the fact that a quarter could end halfway through a pay period so that we might end the quarter with some accrued wages that we haven't paid for but that we've incurred within the quarter. We're going to ignore that for now. We're just going to look at this saying, okay, you know, for cash budgeting purposes, we're going to assume that, that the wages that are incurred in the quarter are paid for in that quarter. So we don't need a schedule of cash disbursements. This becomes our line item entry in the cash budget. The second thing worth pointing out is, look at the fluctuation, 240, then we rise to 620, then we rise to 760 and back down to 390. So if we look at all the direct labor hours we need, we see them building into the third quarter, and then it looks like we lay off a lot of people for the first, fourth quarter, only to start bringing them back on in the second and third quarter of the next year. That may not be realistic or feasible. We may have a union contract that says, look, this is the minimum you have 30 people working for you. All 30 people must work 40 hours a week regardless. So even if you don't have the hours for them to work on something, you got to find something for them to do. So you may not be able to move your labor up and down with this kind of flexibility. In which case, this budget would change to reflect the fact that there is a floor below which labor costs would not drop. We're going to skip that in the chapter itself, but when we get to the problems at the end of the chapter, we're going to encounter a couple of problems where do a budget, assuming that you can adjust your, your, uh, your uh, labor, and do another one assuming that you cannot adjust your labor, that there's a certain amount of labor that must be incurred regardless, and we're going to see what happens uh, when that comes into play. So here is the last of our product costs. Remember the production budget, we did raw materials, direct labor, and now we do manufacturing overhead, and there are a couple of things we have to note in here. This is broken down into variable overhead and fixed overhead. The reason why we do that is because there is a certain amount of overhead that varies with some level of activity. Here it's our budgeted direct labor hours that we got from Schedule 4. So if it's going to vary based on direct labor hours, here's the labor hours that we occur in each quarter. Here's our variable over rate per labor hour. Here's our variable manufacturing overhead per quarter. Then we add our fixed manufacturing overhead for our total manufacturing overhead. But something odd happens. Look at this, less depreciation. Why are we taking depreciation off of our total manufacturing overhead? Well, here's why. It might be easier if we assume a big blank line in between total manufacturing overhead and depreciation, the next line. Because once we have total manufacturing overhead, we're done the manufacturing overhead budget. That's it. That's the last line of the manufacturing overhead budget. What we're doing now is getting it ready for the cash disbursement. So even though we register a certain amount of overhead costs in quarter one, that does not necessarily mean that that much cash has to be paid out. We do not pay for depreciation, but we have to account for depreciation in our costs because we're allocating the, the cost of a long-lived fixed asset against certain periods of time.
even though we don't write a check for it, it's already being paid for, we still have to, because of the matching principle, match that cost with the revenue. It's a non-cash expense, so to turn the manufacturing overhead expense into a cash disbursement number, we have to deduct all the non-cash expenses. Now, that being said, this is a very simplified example, and I'll tell you why. Number one is because all we're doing is taking depreciation off and we're assuming that once we get our cash disbursements, we're assuming that all overhead costs within a quarter are paid for in that quarter. So that none of, none of the overhead costs we incur are, are, are paid for on net 30 or net 60 days. We just pay for them in that quarter. If there was an accounts payable um, assumption, we would have more entries to fill in below to, to, to adjust the manufacturing overhead cost to cash disbursement. The second thing I'll note, which is not here, but we will encounter it in a problem is, what if in the first quarter we pay all of our property tax, which is a cash disbursement, but because of the way we set things up here for our fixed manufacturing overhead, that's usually spread out evenly over the four quarters, but it's all paid for here. We would have to make an adjustment showing an increase in cash paid out here to pay for all the property tax with an, an accompanying adjustment in each of these quarters to show a decrease in the amount from our overhead cost to our cash disbursement to take it out of there. So this is a simplified example showing one adjustment for a non-cash expense. There may be several adjustments to account for the timing of the expense versus the timing of the payment for the expense. But the important thing is once we get to total manufacturing overhead, the overhead budget is done. The rest is to reconcile the quarter's cost to the quarter's cash disbursement. So there we go. There's our double lines. It looks like we're done, but we have some, some other stuff down here. Let's see what it means. Our total manufacturing overhead, that comes from here. Total manufacturing overhead, that comes before the cash disbursement. Don't use this number. This number is the cash that's paid out. This is total manufacturing overhead. Then we have our budgeted direct labor hours, which are next. Do you see where this is going? We have an estimate for our overhead. We have an estimate for our direct labor hours. If we divide the two, we get a predetermined overhead rate for the year. We've seen this in chapter five when we did job costing, how we calculate a predetermined overhead rate. We need an estimate for the amount of manufacturing overhead that we're gonna incur during the year, divided by an estimate of some activity driver. Here it's direct labor hours. That gives us our predetermined overhead rate. So now we can see that just going through the budgeting process will give us our predetermined overhead rate within the budget process itself. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm.